Good morning to everyone in the US, good afternoon in Europe, and good evening in South Asia. My name is Sanjita Saxena, and it is a great honor on behalf of the Shubir and Marlini Choudhury Center for Bangladesh Studies to welcome you all to the 2020 Choudhury Center's Distinguished Lecture with Professor Naila Kabir. The Institute for South Asia Studies at UC Berkeley has always had a deep commitment to Bangladesh, but this has been even more pronounced with the establishment of the Choudhury Center in 2013. Through partnerships with leading institutions in Bangladesh, a vibrant lecture and conference series, and support and supported innovative and support of innovative research by graduate students, the Choudhury Center has galvanized debate on many key issues around the economic, societal, political, and environmental transformations facing the country. For years, my colleagues and I at UC Berkeley have wanted to welcome Professor Kabir as the Choudhury Center's distinguished lecturer, but travel times and busy schedules made it very difficult. Now, while we wish we could host her in person, Zoom, though not always ideal, has certainly opened up new possibilities for engagement. Professor Kabir is a professor of gender and development at the Gender Institute at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and she's been there since 2013. This is also where she did her undergraduate and her PhD back in the early 1980s. In 2019, she was named in Key Thinkers on Development and, and by Apolitical as one of the 100 most influential people working for gender equality. She was president of the International Association of Feminist Economics in 2018-19 and has held numerous prestigious international fellowships. But really, Professor Kabir is someone who does not need an introduction. Though an economist by training, her work is truly interdisciplinary and far-reaching. In an interview, she was quoted as saying, I draw on the wisdom of anthropology, economics, philosophy, politics, whatever seems useful to get at the kind of explanations that capture the reality I am studying. Faculty in the social sciences, development studies, public policy, and various other disciplines teach Professor Kabir's work regularly. Students, as well as practitioners in a wide variety of fields, have read and continue to engage with her many articles, research studies, and books as a part of their curriculum. Professor Kabir is the kind of scholar whose work you read and you immediately find it to be insightful and astute. She explains very complex ideas with clarity and what is often so lacking in academia, free of jargon. Her work, both theoretically sound and grounded in empirical, has influenced many scholars, not only in their thinking about poverty, social policy, gender, political voice, and inequality, but has challenged their, their preconceived notions and beliefs about many of these themes. I am no exception. Professor Kabir's work on gender, opportunity, choice, and agency profoundly impacted my thinking about both the potentials and pitfalls of the garment industry in Bangladesh and continues to influence my writing and research to this day. She wrote in an interview, if there is any coherence to be found in my work, it is that I'm trying to bring to life the experience of those that those that are excluded. I hope that the kind of research I do, which is concerned with the empowerment of these groups through collective action, will continue to, to a broader political agenda for, for the democratization of social relations across society. On a personal note, after years of citing Professor Kabir's work and exchanging emails, I had the pleasure of meeting her in person at our joint Bangladesh summit at LSE a few years ago. She was insightful, as I expected, but more importantly, I found her to be a scholar who was generous with her time and knowledge, as was evidenced by her willingness to mentor and engage with junior scholars and students and forge interdisciplinary collaborations with her peers. 
Professor Kabir's talk today is titled Contested Narratives About National Identity, Gender, State, and Community. Her lecture is co-sponsored by the Masters in Development Practice and the Goldman School for Public Policy at UC Berkeley. It is my great pr privilege to welcome Professor Naila Kabir to give this year's Chaudhary Center Distinguished Lecture. Professor Kabir. Thank you very much. That was a very moving introduction. And let me also say how pleased I am to be invited by the uh, Chaudhary Center for Chaudhary Studies at Berkeley. And I'm very sorry that I could never have made it to uh, visit in person. But as you say, COVID-19 has given us all kinds of unexpected opportunities. Let me go then to my talk. <clears throat> so as you can see, this is called Contested Narratives About National Identity. And this particular presentation is part of a book that I'm currently writing, which explores the Bangladesh paradox through a gender lens. The Bangladesh paradox is shorthand for a phenomenon that is being discussed in development studies <clears throat> to refer to the fact that Bangladesh has performed better on a number of social indicators and on gender equality in these indicators, fertility, mortality, education, and so on, than countries with higher per capita incomes, including its neighbors, India and Pakistan. And despite the fact that the quality of its governance is considered to be very poor. However, there is one aspect um, of, of this paradox that has not been addressed. And that is, this progress on gender equality has taken place uh, during a period in Bangladesh's history when we have seen the steady abandonment of uh, the early commitment to secularism as a constitutional principle and the growing visibility of Islam, not just in formal politics and policies, but in all spheres of everyday life. So given the widespread tendency within the academic literature to portray religion and Islam in particular as antithetical to progress on gender equality and women's rights. How are we to explain this aspect of the paradox? So my uh, presentation today is a preliminary attempt to think through uh, an explanation. And it represents an updated version of some of the issues that I wrote about in a book that was edited by our discussant, Professor De De Denise Candiotti, and that book is listed along with other useful references in my PowerPoint. I will be using the terms um, secularism and Islamism to describe the contested narratives of recent years for the sake of convenience, but I will also be suggesting that the distinctions may not always be as clear cut as they could be. So let me clarify first of all what I mean. Could I have the, um, the next slide? So this is the structure of my presentation. Uh, as I've said, I'm going to be talking, trying to explain the religious dimensions of the Bangladesh paradox. Um, but let me clarify what I mean by the growing visibility of Islam in everyday life. Bangladeshi Muslims have always been religious, have always been a devout people, have always prayed regularly and fasted as they are expected to do. But Islam is not a monolithic um, belief system. It may have originated in the deserts of West Asia, but it took root in many different soils. It was nourished by many different indigenous cultures. So that despite a certain, despite a certain commonality of religious discourses and practices, uh, there are many different kinds of Islam. The Islam of Bangladesh is very distinct from the Islam of the Middle East, where it originated. Historians agree that Islam was brought to the Bengal Delta by Sufi preachers who espoused a particularly a mystical form of Islam. It also has elements of syncretism with Hinduism, Buddhism, animism, and all the other belief systems that were indigenous to the Delta region uh, and that were held by people who had lived side by side for many centuries. Despite periodic attempts to introduce a more purist version of Islam in the 18th and 19th centuries, this syncretic Islam has persisted really to contemporary times. So when I talk about the growing visibility of Islam in Bangladesh, I'm not talking about the strengthening of this indigenous religious practice, but the influence of more orthodox and purportedly more authentic versions of Islam from the Middle East, particularly, uh, more specifically, uh, Wahhabi Islam, which is associated with Saudi Arabia. 
It is the growing influence of this version of Islam in Bangladesh that stands out for many of us because it doesn't sound or look like the Islam that we grew up with. We were reminded of these differences within Islam during our 25 years as a Faisai colony of Pakistan, which had been set up as Umayyads for Muslims in South Asia. Bangladesh fought a war to liberate itself from the cultural oppression and economic exploitation it suffered during this period. And by cultural oppression, I mean the strong antipathy held by the Pakistani ruling class towards the syncretic forms of Islam practice in Bangladesh, one which they saw as hopelessly entangled with Hindu beliefs and practices. I understand people are having trouble hearing me. Um, is there some advice? Yes, Naila, I, so we're getting some messages that it's difficult to hear you. I wonder if you can just, um, you know, be up a little bit more and sort of speak directly into the mic. Um, I think okay. you were saying it was a little- uh, Is this any better? I think that is better, yes. Okay. Thank you. So the cultural oppression um, reflected the strong antipathy held by the Pakistani uh, ruling class towards the syncretic forms of Islam practiced in Bangladesh, one which they saw as hopelessly entangled with uh, Hindu beliefs and practices. It was largely in response to this experience that the first constitution of independent Bangladesh adopted secularism as one of its guiding principles, along with socialism, nationalism, and democracy. The principle of secularism was intended to acknowledge, and I'd like the next slide, please. The principle of secularism was intended to acknowledge the equality of all religions in the eyes of the state, um, to ban discrimination on religious grounds, to ban the use of religion for political purposes, thereby banning Islamic parties like the Jamaat, who had opposed the idea of an independent Bangladesh. Uh, and despite Islamic portrayals, Islamist portrayals, secularism was not about turning our back on religion, or about atheism, or about godlessness. It simply sought to promote an ethics of religious tolerance, as spelled out in the words of Sheikh Mujib, which is on my PowerPoint. But this move towards the direction of a more tolerant political culture could not last. Mujib came to power at a time when the country was on its knees. His socialist rhetoric found no favor with the international donor community, while the commitment to secularism did not, did not adhere the new nation to the oil-rich donors of the Middle East. Mujib's assassination by army officers was followed shortly after by a period of military rule under two successive leaders, each of whom spearheaded a drift away from the idea of secularism towards the reinstatement of Islam in different spheres of political life. Can we go back to the first slide, please? So this drift included lifting the ban on uh, Islamic parties, which saw the return of Jamaat, dropping secularism and socialism from the constitution, declaring Islam the state religion. The Middle East aid took off also at this time and helped this shift um, by pouring money into Islamic education and religious institutions in order to promote a Middle Eastern version of Islam. At the same time, there was an offsetting influence as a result of the state's reliance on Western aid. Military rulers spoke the language of men, women and development, set up a ministry for women's affairs, and ratified CEDAW, the Convention Against Discrimination Against Women, although with reservations. The overthrow of Ashad ushered in a period of multi-party democracy with intense competition between the two main political parties. Parallel tracks in state policy geared to both Islamic and secular constituencies within and outside the country continued. Uh, the declaration, the de decline of that party also meant that a space was opened up for the growing influence of Jamaat. Because we have a very split electorate, uh, the Jamaat and other religious parties had had, have had a disproportionate influence on, on uh, the kind of uh, politics and uh, policies that different governments have adopted. The Jamaat aims to turn Bangladesh into an Islamic state. But its earlier orthodoxies with regard to women's role in uh, public life have been somewhat modified in the light of its extremely poor showing in successive elections. They now seem to be proposing a gender segregated public sphere, 
so that women uh, dress modestly and only interact with other women in economic, in economy and their politics. However, the influence of the Western donor community and Bangladesh's need to present itself as a modernizing state has meant that the gender progressive strand of public state policy has also continued in the form of scholarships for girls, support of women in local government, the acceptance of the Beijing Platform for Action without reservations, legislations to curb violence against women, and the employment of women in various uh, public sector jobs. At the same time as this uh, parallel um, trajectory is going on in the level of state uh, and politics, we have seen also similar trajectories at the local level. Okay, so, um, so we have seen also at the level of the community various routes through which um, uh, the Islamic and the secular influences have come in. The Islamic influence at community level has come in through the remittances of you know, the thousands of migrants, mainly male, who go to the Gulf states in order to um, earn a living and who, who see a form of Islam that they feel is closer to where the origins of Islam were and who therefore see this far more authentic and who bring back their remittances and their ideas to uh, finance uh, madrasas and mosques which are very strongly associated with uh, Wahhabi Salafi forms of Islam. Um, there are now uh, Islamic NGOs uh, that started out as relief organizations, but increasingly are involved in uh, uh, social services and in trying to train people to learn to live a more authentic life. Education obviously has played a huge role in the battle of ideas. And while the Jamaat has uh, used the universities, the private universities to recruit, it really has been through the um, classes held at grassroots level, uh, including the Thaleen classes and local madrasas, through which uh, Islamist ideas have come into the countryside. And within this, we see the distinction between the Kawami and Aliyah madrasas, with Aliyah madrasas teaching a state-governed curriculum with uh, religion as well as other, other um, uh, topics, which are supposed to equip them to compete in the modern life. But the Kawami madrasas have jealously guarded the right to teach primarily an education, uh, a religious education, and a much more a Sharia focused uh, version of Islam. And it has been the Islamic clerics from the, uh, from the Kawami madrasas that have actually been behind some of the more intolerant aspects of the Islamic influence, calling for the banning of the Ahmadiyya sects who have lived in this country in, in, in Bangladesh since the early 1900s, um, uh, trying to declare them as non-Muslims, resisting efforts to reform the uh, Kwame Madrasa uh, curriculum in any way. And the other influence, of course, has been uh, social media, the Mahfil, uh, the Waz Mahfils, you know, meetings through which uh, messages about the correct form of Islam have been disseminated in the other level of the grassroots. But of course, there has also been that secular strand. Uh, education remains a largely secular uh, institution, even though religious education was taught, uh, but it teaches other skills and knowledge, again, for Bangladesh to compete in the global economy. Uh, and also associated with the secularist ideology is, are the NGOs, the development NGOs. The role of the development NGOs, uh, because Bangladesh has a disproportionate number of them, has been remarked on in uh, much of the discussion about the Bangladesh paradox. Uh, indeed, anything that the development NGOs, through their outreach into the countryside, have been a major factor behind some of the social progress that we have seen. But of course, development NGOs have changed. They began out as quite radical, as uh, committed to social justice, uh, as uh, often socialist in their orientation. And at that time, they were funded by sort of charity NGO, Oxfam, et cetera. But over the years, they have become very much a vehicle for uh, Western donor um, ideas about the market, about neoliberalism, but also about women's education and employment. Now, NGOs have been singled out by Islamists as conveyors of secular ideas and alternative models of womanhood to, their, to those of their, to, to their own. Uh, but actually, it is probably the case that the vast majority of the staff of, uh, of the NGOs are practicing Muslims and pray like everybody else in the country. 
But what NGOs do not do is largely relate against other religions, uh, nor do they uh, invest a great deal of effort in publicizing the religious ideas. But they are secular only in that sense. Far more explicit about the politics of secularism has been a small but highly active women's movement uh, and human rights organizations who have constantly uh, punched about their weight, challenging the declaration of uh, Islam as state religion on the in signed second class citizenship to women and minorities. Uh, they have sought to outlaw fatwas, which are often used as a weapon against individual women who step out of line. And they have sought to promote respect for human rights for all of the country's citizens. But I want to pause here for a minute to think about this idea of secularism, since it has played such a role in our uh, national consciousness and debate. <clears throat> it has been turned into a term of abuse by many uh, Islamist parties and their supporters. But what we have to understand is unlike the rise of Islamism among sections of the population in Bangladesh, which has been the product of purposively directed uh, funds and efforts, the fact that a secular space continues to exist in Bangladesh reflects both intended but also unintended influences. A secular space can be seen as a space which either excludes more religion or includes all religion. It is an inclusive space. But there are many ways in which such, space, such spaces, <laughs> there are many ways in which such spaces are manifested in Bangladesh, not all of which we would wish to support. Religious identity is not to the forefront in uh, many aspects of secular life, from uh, advertising, Bollywood movies, social media, talk shows, soap operas, cultural gathering, gatherings of many long a part of Bengali tradition. These are all secular spaces, but they have not been created by the efforts of those who the Islamists call secular extremists, nor are they welcomed by all sections of those who think of themselves as secular. It is very interesting in, in reading some of this material that an Islamic Talim, uh, uh, Talim participant of the Talim classes referred to the sexual women on billboards and Bollywood movies as a manifestation of women's lib. When so many secular feminists in Bangladesh and elsewhere would condemn it as a part of the commodification of women's bodies, which they oppose. So there is secularism as a political stance and ethics of religious tolerance. And there are secular spaces that exist as a part of everyday life that have taken on new forms as a result of globalization. And what this means is that secularism encompasses conflicting politics. We see this in some of the debates about NGOs. Educated urban-based secular critics routinely criticize the state for not having done enough to reach out to the poor with basic services and access to justice. But they have also rounded off NGOs for having displaced the state for having done too much or too little or done it wrong or as agents of imperialism. At the same time, there are others within the secular space who point out that it was a weakness of the state that led to the funding of the NGOs and their effectiveness in providing social services. Also point out that it was the absence of the left in the countryside that created the space for NGOs with a progressive agenda. So let me now just zoom in on two debates, which I think where contestations about gender and women's roles in community have been to the forefront, and which tell us something about the very different positions held by various protagonists in these debates, including feminists, and where those on the secular Islamists continuum. I will then go on to the views of some of those who have not been uh, participating in these debates. The first is that 1990 saw uh, a series of attacks on NGOs who were seen as promoting uh, Islamic, non-Islamic practices in fields of employment, health, and uh, education. Uh, they surrounded NGOs, they attacked their staff, they burnt their offices, um, they, they denounced them for fatwas and was mafils. They believed that the NGOs were agents of the West teaching anti-Islamic practices and trying to convert their students to Christianity. They attacked NGOs for providing family planning and education about women's bodies. They attract, attacked them on the grounds that they challenge interest, which is un-Islamic, and requiring women to interact with uh, male officers and go outside the home. While those who, who, who supported these attacks, claimed that they were defending Islamic values against the onslaught of Christian uh, conversion. 
many secular observers interpreted the attacks as a conservative Islamic backlash against progressive values. However, as a number of feminists who researched these issues pointed out, uh, the attacks brought together different sections of the ruling elite in the defense of their traditional privileges, which were being threatened in various ways by the gender equality agenda of the NGOs. Michael was allowing women to take up self-employment, tightening the market for female labor and allowing them to bargain for better wages, those who had to do wages. Landlords were losing a, a cheap source of labor. Uh, it was harder to get domestic help. Money lenders were losing out their traditional clients to the microfinance organizations, uh, since men as well as women were benefiting from these uh, loans. Madrasas and mullahs were not only threatened by the egalitarian rhetoric of the NGOs, but the fact that the NGO schools were competing with them uh, to teach children. Um, and above all, as one of the authors pointed out, men from different social groups also saw their patriarchal authority being threatened by the language of gender equality and women's rights and by the opportunities being provided to women. So this was not a purely Islamist movement. It was a defense of privilege of the privileges of class of gender, uh, class of patriarchy. A second set of debates has focused on the Quranic study circles which have proliferated in both urban and rural areas and have been attended by women from different social classes. Some of these are affiliated to religious parties like Jamaat, some to non-political parties movements like the Tabliq Jamaat, and some are not affiliated to any group at all. The way they are conducted depends on what their affiliation is. Uh, at, but the basic approach is the same. There is a woman, uh, a preacher, who is considered to be uh, an expert on her Quranic uh, texts, and uh, she conducts the classes. And what is taught is very similar, the need for men and women to abide by responsibilities assigned to them by their religion, uh, which require men to be providers and for women to prioritize their duties as wives and mothers, for women to submit their, themselves to the authority of their husbands, uh, the need to follow prescribed religious rituals or praying and fasting, to cover themselves with appropriate Islamic veiling when they go outside, to turn away from traditional forms of recreation such as singing and modern forms of recreation such as TV. A number of feminists have argued, a number of feminists have argued that these classes have provided a range of women with a way to live a more authentic life, an authentic spiritual life, in keeping with what the original Islamic text had set out, as well as a way to convert others to their, their worldview, or in the case of Jamaat, to recruit others to the political party. Clearly for feminists who have fought for more egalitarian relations between men and women within and outside the home, <clears throat> some of the messages that are communicated are antithetical to their beliefs. However, as Abu Lagod reminds us, uh, emancipation, struggle, equality, and rights are not necessarily universal values, and we have to accept that we all have to accept. Uh, closeness with family, cultivation of piety may be of greater priority for many women in many parts of the world. They may be called to personhood, so to speak, in a different climate. However, while accepting that we need to respect the choices of different women's ways to search for personhood, there are two questions that my reading of the literature of these classes raises for me. First of all, my question is, to what extent are the women in these classes allowed to question the preacher? Of course, there is scope for discussion about meanings and interpretations. Uh, but for instance, if women are being told that this is what is said in the Quran, to what extent can they ask, is it indeed what is said in the Quran, since many of them cannot read the Quran? So I've read about uh, one Talim participant, Talim class participant, who expressed her rejection of the Talim Appa's uh, preacher's claim that men are naturally polygamous, that it was better to let them marry several times rather than have sinful affairs and to take other wives if their current wife was too sick to satisfy them sexually. This clearly caused consternation within the class as it seemed to sanction male promiscuity and at least one of the women left. But these were educated and affluent women and in, even here, the attention given to this example to illustrate that the preacher's interpretation was not 
hegemonic, suggests that it was an isolated case of questioning. And in another study in a small district town, one of the Pantaleen participants expressed the belief that even to question the authenticity of the teachings, uh, was it indeed said in the Quran or not, was itself a sin. Now, there has been a long tradition of men interpreting religion to, up, to imposing their versions on others. To what extent are these classes reproducing that practice? My second concern uh, revolves ar around the fact that the textual Islam being preached in these classes is clearly not the indigenous Islam of Bangladesh. The use of Arabic rather than Bengali religious terms to the clothes that women have begun to wear to signal their adherence, there is an attempt to uproot what is Bengali about Muslim beliefs in Bangladesh and to, is, to interpret images of Sufism as impurities of the past and to require participants to relearn the correct religious rituals as they are practiced in the Middle East. In other words, the rituals and practices, the culture of religion appears to be at stake, Wahhabi versus Bengali practices. And here I see what appears to be a clash between tolerance and intolerance. I see this clash in an account by Sarah White of two women she interviewed, both active in their religion, both regarded as having religious authority in their community, um, both stressing the core beliefs and practices of Islam, not just as religious obligation, but as a source of profound joy and pleasure. However, their beliefs and practices diverge in ways that I believe illustrate the differences between a tolerant and a less tolerant Islam. The Orthodox Muslim woman in the, in the study believed that saris were too revealing a garment for a pious Muslim woman. The secular Muslim woman believed that, sorry, that modesty lay in how you dress and how you conduct yourself. The Orthodox Muslim woman believed that women should never go out of the house except for Indian women. The secular Muslim woman believed that Islam has never forbidden women from working only outside, only that they do so with decorum. The Orthodox Muslim woman saw the relationship between religion and politics in terms of the relationship between the tablik and jamaat. The secular Muslim woman regretted the politicization of religion and believed that Hindus and Muslim neighbors were part of the same community. Finally, while both women grounded their understanding of Islam in the sacred texts of the Quran and Hadith, and both stressed the priority of the Quran and Hadith texts against alternative sources of authority, the other against which they set their texts were very different. So for the orthodox believer, the despised other against which she set her own understanding of Islam was Bengali culture, which she saw as infused with Hindu thought and the source of contamination and impurity, especially in the field of gender-related social evil. For the secular Muslim believer, the other were the Maulanas, uh, the popular preachers who propound and often misinterpret uh, views about Islam to, pro to propagate their own views of what is appropriate. There's one other question which was not asked, and that is, that is when we examine these different versions of religion, Given the emphasis in some of the feminist literature on Talim classes as part of the active construction of the self, who is the other that is defined in opposition to the self? And what place do you assign to the other? It is interesting that some of the members of these Talim classes talked about how they were drifting, becoming more distant to friends and neighbors who were Hindus through their participation in Talim classes. Let me turn now. Now to the accounts of those who are frequently talked about in these debates, but not always heard. How do men and women from moderately poor, poor and moderately poor households in the towns and villages, how do they cope with the various secular and Islamic agencies that seek to influence their consciousness, their subjectivities, and their behavior in order that they conform more closely to their respective view of gender relations and gender position? The research carried out on the attacks of the NGOs remind us that men and women from poor households have very little room for maneuver when dealing with injustices in their lives. The state is distant and effective, rural elites, religious clergy, the NGOs are in close proximity. 
If they stay silent in the face of fatwas against members of their own class, it is because speaking, the costs of speaking are too high, but it does not mean that they accept the legitimacy of the fatwas. If they join NGOs, this does not mean that they are turning their backs on their religion or seeking to become more empowered. A poor woman's preoccupation will be to ensure she is for herself and her family and to conduct herself as a good Muslim by her own criteria and by the criteria of her community and of God. In that, in that the NGOs can offer her access to finance, to health services, to education for her children, she will take advantage of them. And if the Jamaat denounces women like her who work in the public domain, she will not vote for them. When the attacks happened on NGOs, these women mounted their own covert and overt defenses. They spoke to educated people that they knew to ask them what they respected, to ask what their opinions were. Uh, they sought out alternative fatwas to protect their access to health services. They circulated their own stories, mocking the hypocrisy of some of those who were attacking them in the name of Islam. Uh, they asked schools to include religious education so as to stave off some of the criticism. They asked schools to stop clapping and teaching songs and dance, an essential part of joyful teaching, uh, joyful learning, as it seemed to attract the hostility of the mullahs. They explained patiently to skeptical or hostile family members about the benefits that they had got uh, from the NGOs and that their family members got. They got men in their families to guard the schools at night so that they weren't burnt down. There was also some overt resistance where women got together in groups and confronted some of the um, people who were attacking the NGOs. Many NGOs have gone beyond the provision of social services to promoting the greater awareness of rights of women. Women have become more confident about speaking in public, about holding their own in the face of authority, what Naomi Hossein calls rude accountability. NGOs have diversified sites of seeking justice, and there is now much greater likelihood that people from poorer backgrounds, particularly NGO members, will be asked to participate in this schools, uh, in, in informal justice forums. My own research with, with uh, the Bangladesh Institute, with the Brack Institute of Governance and Development, suggests that the kind of impacts that NGOs achieve very much reflects their strategies. And that the decline of social mobilization NGOs and the dominance of the sector of my, by microfinance means that the space for social mobility and deliberations about injustice that, you, that they used to enjoy have gone to be replaced by transactional relationships around microfinance. From their point of view, Talim classes, which allow women to congregate in neighbors' houses where they can prepare food and talk to each other, is a form of sociability that most husbands do not object to. Here, of course, they are taught that what they have been practicing all these years in terms of religion is wrong, that they have been using the wrong terms, that the saris they wear are immodest because they show their figures, uh, that they need to adopt more traditional burqas or some form of outer clothing to wear masks and veils, socks and gloves, and maybe dark glasses for full modesty. Such in instructions about uh, how you wear, what a good Muslim woman wears, enrages poorer women who are not only unable to afford these garments, but would not be able to conduct their livelihood activities in this way. As one of these women told us, they tell you to wear a bokha and cover yourself from head to toe in the Talim class, and then we have to go out into the field and hitch up our saris right up to our ankles in order to be able to work. And this class dimension of what is being taught is often missing from some of the feminist literature on Talim classes. Of course, all of this has not stopped the spread of veiling. Uh, and we did um, a, a survey in 2008 and then follow the same women again in 2015. And we found that the percentage of women who always bail themselves when they left the house had gone up from around 48% to 61% in 2015. But what has also become clear from our qualitative research is using strict veiling as an index of strict religious beliefs is not adequate. Let me unpack some of the meanings about strict veiling about veiling practices that emerge from our qualitative research. First, we should be clear that status norms and religious injunctions overlap a great deal. There are certain women who believe that it is essential for a pious Muslim woman 
to cover herself fully in the public domain so that no one is able to tell any say anything about what her age is and what the shape of her body is. In fact, it was best not to go out at all. And then there were women from whom state strict veiling was an indicator of family status rather than religious beliefs. Women in Mia Bari or this Bari or that Bari never go out without veiling. So there was a status element to it. There were reasons of convenience. You did not have time to iron your clothes or mend your clothes or you could not afford you know, new clothes. So there was a kind of a democratic element to veiling since uh, everybody looked the same. Not everybody, but there were instrumental reasons. One woman was able to sell her produce in a van outside the, the bazaar by wearing strict burqa so that no one could recognize her. Another woman used the burqa to smuggle saris across the Indian border. And she said because she was fully clad in modest clothes, uh, she was never harassed by the guards. There are also fashion reasons. As one mother told us, a lot of her, her daughters and her daughter's friends were now wearing various forms of uh, tempering as fashion statements. And these are very colorful and uh, often very flowing and uh, many you know, um, different styles. And of course, they have not fooled mullahs who have railed against what they call the fashion burqa. They do not see that this form of burqa is particularly religious. And finally, there is the question of security. Women suffer a great deal of harassment in the public domain when they go about their business, whether they're going to school, to college, to work. Harassment that the Jamaat and its allies say they would not suffer if they just stayed at home. But of course, that is not an option for many women. Bailing offers what one woman has, called, somebody has called a portable version of home. So rather than staying at home, they carry their home with them. It does not uh, rule out sexual harassment, but it does reduce its likelihood. So one of the reasons for spelling out the different meanings and motivations that women attach to what they are wearing is both a warning to feminists like myself, not to assume that we understand the relationship between the signifier and the signified, but also to remind us that there is as yet no uniformity in the beliefs and practices of Islam in Bangladesh. It is in this continued diversity in the meanings attached to religion that we may find answers to the question that I set out at the start. How was it possible for Bangladesh to make progress, the progress it made on gender equality, during a period that saw a rising tide of religious orthodoxy in political and public life? It is very possible that the years of equivocal Islamization or equivocal secularism, however you want to define it, have left the country open to competing discourses, competing visions of the good life, both now and in the hereafter. The culture of rights may have failed to take root very deeply within local beliefs, but the idea of rights and the idea of women's rights have been in the air for a very long time. And equally, we may say, perhaps believe, that the orthodoxy has not taken root, that the old syncretic traditions still persist beneath the surface of orthodoxy. But Bangladeshi men and women in the countryside and in the uh, urban areas continue to do what they have always done, to draw from different belief systems around them in ways that make sense to them and allow them to pursue a better life for themselves and their children. And we should also point out that while we have been lauded for our progress on gender equality, it has been a fairly limited form of gender equality. Comparing us to Pakistan and Bangladesh, um, Pakistan and India is starting from a very low base. Yes, we have made progress in health and education, but um, as far as the economy and politics goes, despite the fact that we are an unusual country in having, in having had two women in power for the uninterruptedly almost for the last 30 or 40 years, women still are uh, very rare are not very active in the political domain. It still remains an area where um, a patriarchal attitudes make it quite difficult. And the rising late rates of female labor force participation is largely made up of home-based self-employment. Uh, despite the visibility of the garment sector, most women who are economically active in Bangladesh are economically active within the home, thanks to finance, which has allowed women to withdraw from exploitative forms of wage labor and to earn a respectable living from home. 
And there is, in my final comment, when I turn to the rising, rising tide of Islamism in Bangladesh, if this is something that gives people in general, and women in particular, a sense of purpose in their lives, their own pathway to personhood, as Abu Ligod has put it, then that is a positive outcome. My question is to what extent are Islamists prepared to accommodate other pathways to personhood? Is there space within the kind of uh, state that they envisage for both secular as well as Islamic pathways to personhood? Or is there only room for one kind? Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kabir, for your wonderful talk. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Denise Candioti, who will give a response to Prof Professor Kabir's lecture. Professor Candioti is an author and researcher in the fields of gender relations and developmental politics in the Middle East, specifically Turkey. She holds a PhD from London School of Economics. Her work on gender and Islam especially in post-colonial and rural development areas, has been influential throughout the entire field. She has pioneered new research into understanding the implications of Islam and state policy on women, and as a result, has brought more attention to this field. As of 2010, Professor Candioti is Emeritus Professor in Development the School of Oriental and African Studies, where she began working in 1992. She has done consultancy work for a number of organizations, including UNDP, the ILO, UNESCO, to name a few. So uh, welcome, Professor Candioti. We look forward to your conversation. I hope you can all see me and good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, well, I'm very pleased to be here because I was rather hoping that Naila would one day return to the work she interrupted for many years on Bangladesh, which was her chapter on a book I edited called Women, Islam and the State. And of course there, all the complications of a Bangladeshi case were fully on display, except they've become even more complicated. So I will contribute three comments on Bangladesh from an outside perspective and two queries basically. The comment is that when you look at the general literature on gender Islam and secularism in post-colonial context, the tension between authenticity and foreignness is always with the West. The West is the other, very unambiguously, in the Middle East, even in Turkey. Whereas when Naila made our contribution to our volume, I was struck by the fact that the relationship with Pakistan complicated that greatly because you had an added dimension of complexity uh, between the authenticity represented by Bengali identity, which could be a pole of nationalism, and Islam, which became tainted initially by its association by a quasi-colonial power. So this is the only country I can think of where secularists can talk about Islamist collaborators literally in terms of treason. There is no other case study I'm aware of. So that's uh, the first thing. The second is the very different development path and the extent to which the absence, the limited reach of the state from many areas of social life has led on the one hand to NGOization with its own package of practices and ideologies and their remittance economy, which had exactly the opposite effect. So while you had NGOs which were Western funded coming in, you had funding flows which were probably even greater. I'm not sure what the proportion was from uh, Bangladeshi migrants in Gulf and other states bringing not just money, but of the cultural products and orientations and forms of distinction, of social distinction, indicative of mobility, which involves certain forms of consumption, dress, uh, hajj, etc. Okay, so you had, if you like, new cultural codes being imported into the country. So 
to my mind, this is what in the general literature, in the general gender Islam and nationalism literature, that make the Pakistan case quite unique and uh, quite specific. Now, as to the questions, the way in which things have evolved and the way you describe Islamization, because I come from a context where a similar process has taken place, I would like by saying that there are also commonalities. The commonalities with other cases is that during the Cold War period, all the countries which were considered to be part of the Green Belt, the fight against communism, had funding poured in to creating an Islamic infrastructure, a press, madrasas, and so on. Even in Turkey, which is supposedly a secular country, this started happening in the 1960s through associations to combat communism with funding from Rabita to Islam, which as you know, is the aid branch of Saudi Arabia. So I imagine that when it came to unseating Mujib and all that, it was a perfect storm because you know there was not going to be any tolerance for a socialist leaning governments, even non-aligned governments come to that. So that's the commonality. As to the question, one of the effects of Islamization, which in Turkey has been going on for many long years, not just with the last almost 20 years of an Islamist government in power, there was a political economy that came with it. And a new section of capital which in Turkey is called green capital, <laughs> okay, which also fomented the rise of a new middle class and a new elite. Now, I don't know to what extent you have parallel, you know, uh, phenomena in, in Bangladesh, but the result of this was that the adoption of Islamic ways in dress, in custom, etc., became, if you like, a marker of membership to a particular new elite, which had its own weddings, type of weddings, its own, you know, there was a whole reinvention of traditions in an Islamic mold, you know, and that was due to this uh, political economy. The paradox, however, which I also sense in some of the examples that you gave about women having different interpretations and so on, was that the generation that was brought up under this regime actually became much more individualistic, much more consumerist, and much more interested in doing their own thing. So you had, in sociological terms, if you like, a situation which some political um, sociologists like Asaf Bayat who works on Iran called post-Islamism. In other words, refusing the categories of Islamism, which in fact is a political term because it refers to political Islam. That is to say, where actors have a political project that involves the capture of the state and the institution of Sharia in everyday life. So that's, you know, uh, what is meant by that, you know, vaguely, uh, there are various definitions. Olivier Roy gives another definition, is that personal piety cohabits with greater demand for individual freedoms and democracy, freedom of choice. So how does this manifest itself in many parts of the world? I don't know how it is in, in Bangladesh. It manifests itself in the field of consumerism. I think you alluded to that which means that you have Islamic fashion houses, catwalks, influencers, you know, ladies who go on the web and advertise their products, which are modest products, although that definition, I have to say, is stretched to the limit. So what would be good is to hear about the changes in Bangladesh uh, in terms of the emergence of new classes mm -hmm. with new vested interests and new culture. Mm -hmm. And finally, I will close there because we have limited time. 
the impact on the new generation. Because what is very interesting about the new generation coming even from Islamic and pious families is that they seem to be quite keen on deciding what they want to do themselves. This became very apparent in the Middle East during the Arab uprisings, where you had girls and boys mingling, some of them, you know, quite décolleté, I might say, others veiled, side by side. We saw the same phenomenon in Istanbul in 2013. So it appears that despite the efforts of powerful orthodox um, foci, shall we say, like certain madrasas or certain preachers, to bring this generation under control, it doesn't actually seem to work very well, basically. So there is a sense in which uh, whether people choose piety for their own self-development or whether they choose something else, we are witnessing the paradox of street level cohabitation against a background of top down, much more authoritarian enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this may have little bearing of, mm -hmm. on what's happening on the ground in Bangladesh, but these are general trends and I would be surprised if you didn't see some of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let me try and answer your question. Thank you very much for those comments. And I, I think you've picked up on some of the, you know, some of the puzzles I think about Bangladesh, of course, not just because of Pakistan, and I did write to friends in Pakistan to say, do Afro Islam came to Pakistan onto a pre existing culture? There was a Sindhi culture and so on. Did they have the same kind of tensions of how you accommodate? But one of the things about Bangladesh, and somebody's called, called it an outlier in the Islamic domain, is that Pakistan is part of a geographically contiguous belt, you know, right from the Middle East, Northern Africa to Pakistan, and then it stops. Then you have India and then you have Bangladesh. So in a sense, the culture of Bangladesh was always very different from the kind of cultures that flourished in uh, and their uh, antipathy to our Islam. Um, in terms of your question, uh, I've been trying to think what the answer might be. And one of the things you have to understand is the money that's been made in Bangladesh has been through the garment industry, uh, through aid. I, I don't think we benefited as much from Middle Eastern aid as did Pakistan and some of the other countries. And so we have Islamic banking and so on, but I don't see a major middle class that has thrived as a result of that. Remittances, by the way, I think now overshadow foreign aid, you know, they are huge. So if there has been an influence, it has been through that kind of bottom-up remittance economy, and that has been very powerful. Um, the other thing that I feel is that when I read, and, and I don't know that much about the Islamic groups, and I will confess that, so what I read, what I understand is from what I have read, but it also from what I get from my research in the field, you know, who are, some of them are Islamic and some of them are not. But one of the things that has struck me is that the jamaat -e islam positions its Itself against what it calls the corruption of the mainstream parties. So it positions itself as not corrupted. I mean, that has been taking a knock recently. Similarly, I think a lot of the women in the middle classes who turn to Islam and Islamic piety and so on. It is in a sense out of a sense of despair about the state of Bangladesh, you know. And so Islam offers, I think, a purer path which uh, moves away from the kind of um, corruption, rent seeking, vulgarity, you know, all of that. So one can have a certain degree of sympathy with that, you know, turning to that as providing a degree of certainty and so on. But I would say that the mixing that there are co educational schools and Islamic women go to them. Uh, uh, colleges and universities. But I would say the kind of mixing that people are comfortable with is much more amongst those who count themselves as ordinary Muslims. 
the normal day-to-day -day Muslim, the kind of people we've always been. And I would also say there is a tension, particularly um, amongst the more stern believers, a generational tension. Because I, I think parents perhaps are a bit puzzled by the need of their daughters to adopt this very alien, you know, clothing and what's wrong with the sari after all, and so on and so forth. So it comes from the older generation or uh, the middle class older generation who grew up with thinking of themselves as Bengali Muslim. It's no tension. You know, it's not a hyphenated identity. It is a fused identity. They are Bengalis who are Muslims and Muslims who are Bengalis. Whereas I think with the younger generation, that kind of fissure is opening up between is being opened up. So it, I think it's harder. You know, at one level, Turkey has had a much longer official tradition of secularism, right? It has uh, gone through a long period of state-sponsored secularism. We have not had that. You know, there was that brief moment where it looked like, because of our experience with Pakistan, that Mujib would succeed in bringing about a tolerance for Muslim religion. But I think things play out very differently in Bangladesh and the different, you know, the different configurations look quite different. I think that's what I can say. Uh, if I may, it may be a question of sequencing because what you're mm -hmm. describing about, you know, being fed up with corrupt regimes, thinking an Islamist regime might bring justice and, you know, that was true in 2001, <laughs> okay? And parents' generations who were, you know, in their suits, couldn't understand why the daughter veiling and so yes. on. But, you know, um, we have hence discovered that corruption can be, become rife, that rent seeking is the brand name of the Islamist corporations, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So from, if you like, 2010 onwards, that, you know, uh, nostalgia for a purer order etc had evaporated mm -hmm. and now it is quite defunct i would say mm -hmm. so the generation of people who were veiling their children now <laughs> are mm -hmm. doing something else so yeah. i think it's very much a question of uh, time mm -hmm. yeah. you know of how long you've had certain regimes as for the long history of turkish secularism i'm one of the people who contest that and who claim that, in fact, uh, under a facade of state secularism, you had a steady rise of mm -hmm. Islamic influences, mm -hmm. first in education, with the starving of funds of uh, secular track public education and substitution of religious schools, and then you know, increasingly. And by the time the 1980 military coup came, secularism was abandoned as an official mm -hmm. policy okay so what you have is the same process mm -hmm. but i think that what makes Bangla maybe what protected Bangladesh in a sense is that it did not have natural sources like oil and petroleum mm -hmm. no no Nor did it have a state-sponsored corporate sector no. that then became you know under neoliberalism something else so mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, limited reach of the state, the degree of poverty, mm -hmm. might have stalled yeah. certain yeah. processes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I certainly think poverty and the kind of shocks we went through, and you know, in spite of of, of economic growth, we are still a poor country. People yeah. still don't have it, you know. And so there's a pragmatism that uh, influences daily life at the yeah. lower level which people uh, may not be aware of at the more comfortable levels. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Candioti, and thank you both for that one um, interaction. Now it is my pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Professor Munis Faruqi, to moderate the question and answer session. Professor Faruqi is the director, the faculty director of the Institute for South Asia Studies, the Sarah Kyleth Chair of Indian Studies and Associate Professor in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies at UC Berkeley. He is a historian with a focus on the Muslim experience in South Asia. 
Thank you, uh, Professor Kabir, um, for a wonderful talk. Uh, there was so much packed in there from a, um, a kind of brief lesson on the history of Islam in uh, the region, you know, East Bengal through Bangladesh, and then, of course, you know, thinking through um, not just uh, larger categories uh, of usage, uh, um, but, you know, theoretical terms, but also thinking very carefully about um, the way in which um, local actors mobilize around very powerful ideas. And I really appreciated the way in which you kind of disaggregated the various forces that would be, you know, interested or threatened um, by a certain kind of NGO presence, gender equality. You mentioned money lenders, landlords, Malvies, uh, other kinds of patriarchal actors. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. I really also appreciate the way in which you took apart um, the reasons for veiling. Uh, I think it's so easy for us, um, you know, whether we sit here in the United States or, you know, we are part of, of uh, you know, I think establishments, secular establishments in South Asia to think of veiling in one way as an increase in a certain kind of religious um, practice and um, not taking into consideration consideration things like, you know, the things that you mentioned, uh, you know, someone trying to use it to smuggle, um, not be harassed, um, you know, the whole gamut, you know, of reasons why people might want to veil um, fashion, uh, which, you know, again, is really, really interesting. So I really appreciated that. And I also wanted to just say thank you, uh, Professor Kandeoti, for your comments. So what I will try and do, um, you know, there have been Lots and lots and lots of questions um, for you, as you might imagine. And I'm just going to say this for our massive uh, global audience. Um, you know, we have more than 250 or 260 people right now. Uh, I have so many questions over here. I won't be able to get to all of them. So, you know, I'm going to beg your forgiveness for that. So what I'm going to try and do is um, taking the questions into account, I'll try and create certain large boxes and maybe ask you large overarching um, questions, mostly based on the questions that I am receiving uh, on my end. So rather than ask you individual ones, which I might get to at the end of the conversation, I'll ask you big ones. So the first one has to do with um, terminologies. A whole folks, a whole bunch of people have written asking uh, you to clarify your understanding of something like, you know, we use the word Islamic law, Sharia. What is your understanding of that term? And I think what people are trying to get you to uh, think through a little bit is that, you know, Sharia is not any one thing. It's not immutable. It's dynamic. It's vibrant. And they, I think people are very curious to hear, you know, when, when academics uh, sure. use it, especially if they're not historians or perhaps um, folks mm -hmm. working in Islamic studies, when we use this kind of catch-all term Sharia, is there some distinction between our understanding of Islamic law as perhaps um, thought through by Malvi's in the late 19th century, uh, middle of the 20th century, perhaps by the Pakistani state versus, you know, the kind of changing experience of Islamists themselves in contemporary uh, Bangladesh. So there's a question about Sharia, there was a question about Bengali Islam. It again, you know, it's always uh, suggested as a kind of uh, um, complement or an not analog, but just, you know, something that is in, in some ways set against um, Middle Eastern Islam. And this kind of binary that gets set up is also something that a whole bunch of people wanted you to kind of prize about. So perhaps we can just start with Sharia, Bengali Islam and Islam, and then we'll go to other sets of questions. Um, let me say, first of all, I'm not an Islamic scholar. I study uh, people's livelihoods, the meanings they make of their lives, and so on. So my understanding of Sharia law is how people talk about it. And one of the questions that I asked in my talk is, are you allowed to challenge the people in authority about their interpretation of Sharia. Are there more than one meanings? Can we trust the preacher who is giving their meaning? Um, and I know for a fact that many of these people are not necessarily very well versed in, even in what they think they are teaching. So I'm not making any kind of claim that there is one Sharia law. What I am saying is that the Islamists in Bangladesh, 
Jamaat Islam would like to see a country run along the principles of Sharia law, whatever they mean. Okay. So putting that to one side, you know, I have no attachment to any particular definition. I'm just telling you that this is how people speak about it. This is their ideal society. Um, and from what I understand of it, it is a very austere society and possibly quite a patriarchal society. The binary between Bengali Islam and um, Middle East Islam comes in because, you know, for centuries, uh, we, we've converted sometime in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, but it was a very much a peasant. So it was a conversion that was led by Sufi preachers and so on. And people lived side by side with others who had other beliefs, particularly Hindus. Even till, let us say, the 70s and 1980s, there are many aspects of practices and beliefs that we have do not, that are frowned upon by those who follow an orthodox version of Islam, which I assume is uh, the Islam that is coming from the Wahhabi school or the Salafi school and so on. And this attempt to say that the clothes we wear, uh, that the language we use, that the rituals we have to mourn, the way that we use song as a part of our lives, all of these things are being challenged by some of the new forces of Islamism. So naturally, many of us see this as in a binary term. You know, maybe it doesn't have to be that way, but I don't understand why it is necessary to regard the sari as an immodest garb. You know, I don't understand why people in the villages are being told that they have to wear gloves and socks in order to be modest. You know, this is a very hot country. So there's all kinds of influences going on uh, in the name of what we're told is truer to Quranic texts. And I think that is what has set up a kind of tension for people. Why is it not possible to continue worshiping in the way that we have always worshiped? Why is it not possible to continue singing in the way that we have always sung? In one of the uh, articles that I read, uh, there's a very you know, moving description of a middle-class Bengali woman trying to keep up singing, something that gave her a lot of joy. And it took her two years or three years from the day she decided to give up singing to the day she actually gave up singing. And yet, when we have done our interviews in, uh, amongst you know, lower middle class, poorer women, singing is a form of joy and a form of religious joy. So they sing to God. And I remember once I asked, uh, I used to go around asking people, what makes you happy, what makes you sad? You know? What gives you joy in life and what gives you sorrow? And one person said, what gives me joy is song. And she said, you know, in the lives we lead, the fact that in what we see as this very dry piece of land, there is water, you know, and it gives life, that is what makes me joyous. So if you think that there is, a, I'm treating it as a binary, it is because I'm reacting to some of the ways that people are preaching Islam that seems to want to eradicate what we practiced as Bengali Muslims. Thank you. A um, whole bunch of questions about um, the various kinds of uh, social groups in society that undergird, um, you know, uh, whether it's Islamists or uh, what we might call, you know, a kind of secular position in Bangladesh. And there were at least three questions um, basically asking you to disaggregate the class foundation of the secularists who like if money lenders and certain other kinds of you know uh, often patriarchs are the ones who are supporting a certain kind of backlash who's kind of propping up um, this this value system or a, a certain kind of understanding of what it means to be Bangladeshi right not just secular but also you know a more capacious inclusive vision you know, I think the term secular, I'm trying to reclaim the term to not mean the absence of religion, okay? And I 
think that um, I don't think that those money lenders are Islamists necessarily, you know, but they see themselves as aligning with some of the Islamic tendencies because that will be, uh, uh, you know, curtailing the activities of microfinance NGOs. So I don't see this going on here as Islam versus the rest. I see it is as Islamists giving support to the rural uh, elites. Who is resisting them? Um, a whole section of the middle classes, just as there is a whole section of the middle class embracing Islamist ideas, there is a whole section of the older middle classes that are holding on to some idea of uh, Bengali Islam. Uh, and in the countryside, I you know, as I said, when people start to uh, go to these classes, some of them go for pious reasons, some of them go for secular social reasons. So I'm not sure I can give you a clear cut class disaggregation who is supporting what. I, I, and maybe other political scientists might be able to do that. But I see much greater confusion, particularly in, in rural areas. Thank you. Um, such a, uh, so if we think about disaggregating the forces that would be um, supporting a certain kind of Islamist vision versus a certain kind of secularist vision, and they're not all, you know, in lockstep another, they are, you know, quite disaggregated, even if we looking from outside tend to place them in one category or another. The question is that if they are disaggregated, the point that you were making uh, toward the end of your talk, to what extent have people um, tried to find ways to bridge these two visions for Bangladeshi society? Um, a number of people have asked that question in light of the fact that it's, it, it's often talked about as in a, uh, a kind of existential struggle, one against the other. And yet, um, you know, I think people would argue that there are people on, on the edges, maybe not the folks on the Men, but certainly people who are more toward the middle who have been reaching out and people were curious as to you know whether you see that happening whether you see any space for um, an effective dialogue between you know someone who might be uh, islamist oriented someone who might be secularist oriented um, and whether that space is growing it's staying steady or whether it is shrinking you know the term islamist and secular Secular is a little misleading. We're talking about debates about religion, right? On all sides, we're talking about debates about religion. What is, and it's a debate about tolerance versus intolerance. And I think the, the precondition for any kind of rapprochement between, let us say, the moderate wings of all these sides is your tolerance towards minorities. You know, to mm. what extent are you willing to give the same rights and the same status to the religious minorities in our country that you are claiming for yourself? And I think, and for me, until we have that, and I think many of us who are consider, you know, ourselves secular, it is around, and that's why I went back to what Mujib had said, that, you know, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, all kinds of people fought for liberation, and they should all be a part of that society. And yet we have had the extreme uh, sections of the Islamists calling for the, uh, you know, not recognizing Ahmadiyyas, not recognizing. There's a very interesting um, uh, study by the Pew Foundation looking at different religions. And interestingly, Bengal, Bengal, Bangladesh was one of the countries that was most open to the idea of Sufism as an aspect of their, of their practice. Not a huge majority, but more so than the other Muslim majority countries. And they were more likely than the other Muslim countries to regard Ahmadiyyas as Muslims. So when we get within the country trying to suppress those aspects of our religion and our beliefs, that rapprochement is going to be difficult. So I think, you know, the way forward for people to coexist with different versions of Islam 
to me, the, the litmus test is our minority rights respected and do at least if you're in this country. Great, thank you. Um, as you might imagine, um, lots of questions about uh, the present um, government in Bangladesh and its relationship to Islamism. And specifically questions, more or less to frame them, um, you know, I think some of what, where they're coming from is that if political authoritarianism is linked to um, certain kinds of conservative gender ideals and uh, uh, heteronormative uh, norms, uh, how does Bangladesh fit in, given the fact that we have an ostensibly secular Awami League um, that has, um, you know, in some ways challenged the Jamaat, but in other respects, according to some of our writers, has also cozied up in some respects with certain kinds of Islamist uh, ideologies and, you know, created space for them. So, you know, um, I guess the question is whether, you know, what you think the role of the government is in this, I mean, the present government is in this Bangladesh paradox. I think the present government takes a lot of claim, uh, and rightly so, but the previous governments also played a role in some of the progress we have made. But I think all the governments that have been in power have been made quite cynical use of religion. And they have not stood up firmly enough to the more intolerant aspects of uh, the Islamic rise, the resurgence of Islam. Um, you know, we have had um, people who call them secular, themselves secular being killed, being shot, being murdered, being macheted. And I would like to see whichever government is in power uh, stand on that. And I don't think that this government has done that. So for all its um, secular credentials, for all the fact that it was founded by a man who believed in the secular, uh, a secular version of Islam, I'm not sure that this government is willing to do that. Um, so questions about um, uh, urban versus rural Bangladesh, as you might imagine. A lot of people asking how um, how effective the extension of a certain kind of vision, secular vision, uh, has been in terms of extending into uh, Bangladeshi the countryside, or has there been actually a recession um, relative to where it might have once been? Or, you know, I think that there are questions about whether one can think in terms of a totality or whether one has to also disaggregate rural or uh, urban Bangladesh, or whether they're all actually part of a kind of continuum. And so uh, if you could just help us with that. I'm being asked to generalize in a way that I don't feel very comfortable. Um, I would say that the rise of Islamic, of this kind of Islamist interpretation of religion has had an effect in the countryside and probably has had an effect in, in urban areas. Has had an effect in the sense that um, you know, we have come across um, pamphlets and uh, were, you know, people talking in ways that we think are hostile to other religions, hostile in particular to Hindus. You know, there's been a kind of strong strand of anti-India, anti-Hindu uh, amongst uh, some of the Islamic parties. So I would say that this has had an effect. You know, I would think, I, I, my impression from, not from looking at statistics, but from looking at the way that people talk, is that while there is still a, a, a modic ruins and so on, we have come across, you know, quite unpleasant pamphlets that are being circulated very cheaply, uh, which are mocking other religions. So, in a sense, um, that tolerance, I think has been taking a steady bashing <laughs> for many, many years. And I don't know mm. whether, you know, how long it will, or how robust it is. And I would say I am depressed about its robustness. Mm. Thank you. Um, so there were uh, a, a series of questions trying to link um, 
such phenomena as neoliberalism and neocolonialism to events in specific countries. The argument being that the discrediting of a certain kind of nibolo, uh, neoliberal ideology, um, you know, US intervention across the Middle East often ends up fueling um, resentment towards what is perceived as a certain kind of, you know, Western uh, um, secular ideology that's coming from overseas. And so people have been wondering as to whether you see like, what do you see as the link? Is there a link? Um, because it's very clearly affirmed in the cases of countries like Pakistan and, and certainly the Middle East. And is that also true in Bangladesh, where the neoliberal model in some respects is often touted as a successful example of neoliberal uh, reforming? And so I was just wondering if you could perhaps put the kind of supra-global uh, into conversation with uh, the national and, of course, the local. Well. You know, one of the points that have been made about Bangladesh is there's very little difference between the two parties as far as their attitudes towards uh, Western models of neoliberalism are concerned. And to some extent, they've had very little um, choice. You know, we have been aid dependent for many years. We have had adjustments. We've had we've been forced to open up our economies. We have benefited in some ways from globalization. So. Um, I would say that, you know, there is, and this is me going out on a limb, I would say that people are quite happy with market forces. You know, I think they have seen prosperity coming in from market forces uh, for, for many people, but, you know, inequality is rising. What I, where I think hostility arises is in the culture that comes with aid and the um, the culture that they see internationally, that is, of course, now crystallized in the person of Donald Trump, but has been there for a very long time. Uh, and the, attitude, um, the invasion of um, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, the treatment of Kashmiris and Palestinians, all of this is also seen as a Western. You know, these are, this is the way that the West has seen Islam. And I think that has been a very powerful factor in fueling support for some of the Islam that is coming in. And it is, um, uh, if you like, I'm just going, it is a gut reaction against the way Muslims have been talked about, treated, the injustices. So markets per se, I don't see, you know, people decrying them. I don't even see the Jamaat Islam saying that much about them. You know, I'm not gonna squeeze the rich or anything and redistribute wealth. But I do see uh, a, a gut level grassroots hostility towards the way that the West has um, positioned Islam. I remember after the, um, after the Iraq thing, there were a lot of rickshaw wallahs, you know, the rickshaw wallahs who had uh, painting, you know, rickshaw art is very big in urban Bangladesh. They're paintings of Saddam Hussein and so on. And, you know, these people were seen as heroes. So I think we need to separate out the culture of neoliberalism and some of the uh, progress that has come as a result of you know, having to compete in, in various forms. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it makes complete sense. I mean, I, I think that's, you know, I think apropos to what's happening in other Muslim countries, take Pakistan as an example as well. Um, and I just wanted to kind of say that certainly in other contexts, I think, you know, NGOs come with a certain set of expectations, donor expectations of accountability, of, uh, you know, breaking through kinship groups and what they see as nepotism, uh, access to English, um, you know, uh, having a certain kind of attitude. We, we don't, you know, diminish cosmopolitan attitudes, but, you know, a certain kind of open, inclusive yeah. attitude. And of course, if you know you for whatever reason, because you wear a beard or you dress in the wrong way or you have the wrong accent, you know, you don't feel like you belong in that world. Um, certainly, a, a way in which it seems alien, and it means you will never benefit from it. But everyone else gets to benefit from it, and especially you know, minorities and others who are not, you know, in, as committed to a certain vision of perhaps being Muslim in society. You know, so it's very complicated, but. You know, we have so many questions over here and what we're going to do is we are uh, going to send you the list of questions. You can take a look at them and 
uh, I would just say that some, uh, some folks may reach out to you, some may not, but I want to thank you so much. Uh, I know we are looking at a very hard deadline here um, in terms of time because you have another meeting to go to, but I wanted to With thank your you students. for... Uh, that's right, <laughs> but still a hard deadline. So I just wanted to thank you so much for being um, not just intellectually so capacious, but also um, accessible. You know, I think sometimes it's easy for us academics to end up in, in, in a world that uh, our audiences sometimes find a little puzzling. And so thank you for making your talk extremely accessible to audiences here in Europe, but also in South Asia. I also wanted to thank our global audience for being so respectful in your chat, in your questions. Um, you know, we do these events and we are often a little fearful that um, these events like this, where you've got someone like Professor Kabir might devolve into some sort of mudslinging uh, event, but that was not true for you. So I thank you very much. Um, I thank you again for your questions. And I'm sorry if I was not able to get to specific questions, but I tried to uh, create as many boxes as I possibly could. And I hope that you heard yours uh, somewhere in there uh, at some point. So on that note, Professor Kabir, thank you so much from all of us. It's been great thank to you. Have thank you. And I just want to say, I hope that, uh, you know, if the world is in a slightly different place uh, post COVID, we would love to have you on campus. Um, and uh, do this again uh, live. So thank you and thank you very much to our audience as well. Take care. Bye-bye.